making public spaces in Denver unpublic to keep people without houses from resting there. Football's what they do, it's not who they are. Broncos players are humans, and humans make mistakes. That's why the Broncos have a guy who helps them make fewer mistakes. A mountain in Colorado has a new name. The governor suggested it's too hard to say. It's not. We'll learn together tonight. Winter is big business in our state. Where are the ski resorts getting the water this year? And we have outsourced our virus research to chickens. We'll head to CSU for that on Nest. Neighborhood right of ways. Interesting name because you and your neighbors don't always have the right to get your way with what happens on your property between the sidewalk and the street. You see Denver's right of ways increasingly filled with homeless encampments. Our Marshall Zellinger went to Cap Hill where some public right of ways appear to be closed to the public. If you didn't know any better, it sure looks like there's a lot of construction projects going on in Capitol Hill near downtown Denver. But we know better. I think it's kind of uglier than the actual tents that would be put up here. Temporary orange fencing tied together yellow caution tape. What's right for this way? They could be living here. Instead, there's like ugly tape. The not so subtle secret that Cap Hill resident Madeline Smith sees is an unwelcome message for those experiencing homelessness. They're like, go somewhere else. But where where are they going to go? They like have nowhere to live. We're having a hard time finding uh, who's following the pop proper permitting. Travis Liker is the president of Capitol Hill United Neighborhoods, who met with the city as head of the registered neighborhood organization where the public rights of way have private pushback. What you see is um, a number of private property owners trying to triage uh, what they think is a a concern or an issue in terms of public right of way enforcement. Take, for example, the corner of 10th and Pennsylvania. The public right of way outside this townhome complex is fenced off. The city park is closed. Hey, that corner has open space, and this one is also fenced off. Then, over at 10th and Emerson, this tree in the public right of way has a no trespassing sign. It's not something you should be doing, putting a no trespassing sign on a tree. I gave the city a handful of addresses and intersections with rights of way fenced off to see if anyone had a legit permit. The permit would allow for temporary fencing to grow landscaping or grass in the tree lawn area. As you've probably figured out, the city had no record of any permits at the locations I passed along. We haven't taken a firm stance in terms of right of way, but what our position is is follow the rules. So what about enforcement and removing the fences where they're not allowed? Denver's Department of Transportation and Infrastructure tells me as they can free up an inspector, they will look at the areas and either ask the property owner to get a permit if they really are landscaping mm -hmm. or ask to have the fencing removed, not remove it themselves, apparently. Driving around town, you see more and more hostile architecture put in by either uh, builders or company owners or private property owners. And, and Travis used that term. I hadn't heard it before, really, mm -hmm. hostile architecture. And it made me think of the pigeons and the, and the little needles that keep them from hanging out on light posts and stuff. And yep. Apparently, you, I've seen boulders. These are just temporary fencing. But there are uh -huh. other places where you ship in a boulder, drop it down. It makes yep. it very uncomfortable to be there. Yep. The stuff that we do to animals, uh, we do to people, too keep them off of places. Also, rights of way, right of ways. You know the social media uh, professors will let us know. I'm going with <laughs> rights of way. You're right. You're right. It is rights of way like attorneys general or courts martial. Compound nouns. That's what we learn about on next. Compound nouns. Thank you, Marshall. The Omicron variant cases do not appear to be particularly severe. Good news. And they don't appear to be spreading very quickly in Colorado. Good news. Still just two confirmed cases. How about more encouraging statistics? Our COVID hospitalizations are continuing to decline. 1,356 patients are currently being treated for COVID in hospitals across the state. That is down 27 patients from yesterday, down 44 from this time last week. Now, to get an accurate idea of how many Coloradans continue to die of COVID, we talked about this. you got to look back a couple of weeks because the reports come in slowly, so it always looks like the graph is trailing off at the far right side. But it's safe to look back to mid-November when we were averaging around 38 deaths per day, similar to what we saw in the peak of the first wave of the pandemic in spring of 2020. I've got a question uh, from a viewer named Karen on pandemic is she saw Steve Stager's reporting earlier this week about vaccine equity clinics being canceled at the last minute across Colorado, which left some underserved communities scrambling to get vaccines to people who were counting on those clinics. 
a clinic put on by Adelante in Commerce City was canceled last Saturday because too many people on the state's team got sick. Organizers said they lined up some replacements, people who could give the vaccines, but they were told the state couldn't verify their credentials in time, so they canceled the clinic. And Karen wrote in to ask if there was a way for other people in the state who were trained to give shots to upload their names and certification ahead of time so they could come in as substitutes when clinics are low on vaccine dis uh, distributors. We took her question to the state's COVID-19 incident commander, Scott Bookman. Uh, we do have the Colorado Volunteer Mobilizer, uh, which is a place where volunteers can sign up uh, to participate in clinics with us. Uh, this volunteer mobilizer allows us to verify the credentials of people, uh, ensure that they are safe to be working in these clinics. Uh, you know, this is a medical uh, procedure, and we need to make sure that uh, the people who are participating in this are qualified to do so. Anybody who wants to be considered to volunteer can sign up through the Colorado Volunteer Mobilizer. Website's on your screen, covolunteers.state.co.us, covolunteers. Bookman said today they are continuing to see a shortage of vaccinators. They're working to increase their staffing to avoid future cancellations. So, you know, holiday is prime time for bad decisions, like grabbing the keys to drive home after the company Christmas party. And pro athletes are just like the rest of us, only with more money and more physical ability. They, too, do dumb and dangerous around the holiday time. That's where Ray Jackson comes in. He's vice president of player development for the Broncos. He is the man responsible for educating new players on avoiding stupid decisions, whether that's rookies or veterans coming aboard. Jackson told us he starts by teaching the new Broncos about the city, about the history of the franchise, and then he gets into life skills and decision making emphasizing to them that they are under the microscope all the time, especially in a city like this that is as focused on football. Each day, we, the good Lord allows us to put our feet on the ground and wake up. There's decisions, choices, and consequences that we have to make. And so just talking to them on the day-to-day, -day, uh, some things may be learning how to say no to people, um, um, uh, whether it be your time, whether it be your finances, whatever it may be. It's when you're talking about driving out in public or being out in the public eye. It's about making the right decisions, not only just our players, but people in general. We all need to make that stance and make the right decision. But we hold a lot of weight in the city of Denver. And so if we lead by example, we do the right things, uh, hopefully the rest of the city will, will lead by that. Isn't that a good way to think about it? Lead by example. Jackson says he tries to talk to his players about putting together a game plan before they go out for the night and knowing that they can call him, call him personally, anytime, day or night, if they need a ride somewhere. Now, certainly his efforts don't mean that Broncos players are immune from making mistakes. Running back Melvin Gordon was charged with DUI August of last year. In March of this year, the DUI charges were dropped and Gordon pleaded guilty to reckless driving. Colorado is getting a new mountain, just a well, new name on an old mountain. Mountain's been there for a while. It's in Clear Creek County, south of Idaho Springs. The original name is word now considered widely offensive, especially to indigenous women. The new name is one that Democratic Governor Jared Polis expressed some concern that people would have trouble pronouncing. Well, we can learn. We've got a segment for that. We reached out to the tribe that pushed for the name change to ask, what do you say? My name is Tiana Limpy. I'm the Tribal Historic Preservation Officer for the Northern Cheyenne Tribe of the Northern Cheyenne Reservation in Montana. It's Ms. Dahit. Uh, Mista for us is owl, it's what we uh, liken to like an owl. And then uh, hit is woman, so you have put Mista hit together, it's an owl woman. The E with the little circle, you know, that's silent. We tried to find a written alphabet that was closest to how we pronounced in German was the, the, the I guess, the, the vocabulary that we followed. And we took some of that from the, the German alphabet and so that's why it's spelled that way. I mean, you know, we, we've continued to work on how to say things, you know, <laughs> easier because even our own tribal people have a, have a hard time reading, reading it in, in English. Owl Woman was the wife of William Bent, owner of Bent's Fourth, the trading post in southeastern Colorado. She worked as an interpreter and a mediator between the tribes and white traders and soldiers. The mountain name change to Mistahet Mountain was approved unanimously this morning by the U.S. Board of Geographic Names. We talk all the time about the preciousness of water in our state. They're relying on us being good stewards of the snow and the water. Some of you have wondered where ski resorts get all that water to make snow when it isn't coming down naturally. 
tracking the West Nile virus in northern Colorado. Chickens are out there doing our dirty work. Next. The biggest storm of the season approaching Colorado tonight with cloud cover. We still manage mid 50s today. It'll be a whole lot colder tomorrow with the arrival of a front after midnight. Moisture plume extends from western Colorado right into the Pacific and we've got winter weather and travel advisories for heavy snow overnight. Winter driving conditions on I-70 with that winter storm warning at your favorite resort. Steamboat, Aspen, Copper, Loveland, Crested Butte, Telluride, one to three feet of snow by Friday and between 5 a.m. and lunchtime on Friday, maybe a little snow here in Denver and finally bust the snowless streak. Let's hope not a big storm for the front range, but I'm saying there's a chance. And so in Denver for tonight, we'll call it mostly cloudy, windy, late and colder, low 26 snow showers early tomorrow, then clearing high 35, low 13, a warming trend heading into the weekend back to sunshine and 60s by Monday and Tuesday. Tonight's next question is about water and how our state's ski resorts use that precious resource. Chuck and John had similar questions. With the snowpack starting so slow, they wonder where the ski resorts will get water for snowmaking. We took the question to meteorologist Corey Reppenhagen. At Winter Park Resort, they're making winter happen. Well, snow is our business, and so snow is vitally important. Snowmakers here say that snow is in their blood, which means water is in their veins. We're connected to the land in a way that you aren't when you're in an urban area. These snowmaking machines have not run as often this season because of the warm temperatures. But when they are making magic, they can use 80 to 100 gallons of water per minute. The resort has the rights to use a set amount of water from the Fraser River system. We want people to be able to maximize the beneficial use of the waters of the state. That's what our Constitution says. That's what we want to happen. Kevin Ryan with the state of Colorado says that every ski area has different water rights, but the state has specific records that show who's using water, how much they're using, and for what purpose. About 80% of the water that gets diverted in Colorado goes to agricultural use. 6.6% is for commercial and municipal use, while 8.2% is for other uses. Of that fraction, snowmaking represents less than a tenth of a percent. But Winter Park says even that fraction of water is important, so they're upgrading their snowmaking system to be even more water efficient because they say they're not just making snow for skiers, they're making snow for everyone. We're essentially a holding tank for water. Ryan says that nearly all the water we use in Colorado starts out as snowpack in the mountains, and that includes the snow packed into the ski runs. Uh, we're the headwaters of the Fraser River, which then uh, feeds into the Colorado River. Most of the water they take out of the river in the fall goes right back into the river when the snow melts in the spring. Ryan says the water used to make snow in Winter Park will get used several more times before it leaves the state of Colorado. It may be diverted by a water user in Kremlin, for irrigation purposes and apply it to the field. Some of that's going to be consumed, but some of it's going to go into the ground and go right back to the Colorado River. There's a lot more benefit to snowfall than just having fun on skis. Meteorologist Corey Reppenhagen for next. Winter Park and most other ski areas typically only use those snow guns October, November, December, and that happens to be the time of year with the lowest demand for water elsewhere in Colorado. Most of our state's water use goes to watering crops and lawns and landscaping during the spring and summer. The West Nile virus is still around, even if that's not the virus we talk about. CSU is researching its spread using some unique test subjects. Chickens are a great study population. Um, you know, they generally have pretty good personalities and they're pretty easy to handle. Um, and they're also just, in, you know, they don't, they don't bite. Denver's newest transplants are being packed up now. They are moving here to avoid extinction. This is basically just a show about animals. Next. So not to add another virus to the conversation, but you know, uh, West Nile hasn't gone anywhere. A researcher at Colorado State University is studying a new way to detect that virus before it gets to people. This involves chickens and our Brian Wendland. <laughs> You're okay. <laughs> chickens make great pets. I kind of love our little girls. They're excellent pest controllers. They single-handedly wiped out our grasshopper problem. But they aren't the best TV subjects. We'll see if any of them will let me hold them. Probably not. Oh, now that's very scary, huh? <laughs> 
<laughs> yes, we're very good at this evasion technique. But Angela Bosco Louth says they are great lab partners. We got this idea to use chickens as a source of um, essentially looking for where West Nile has shown up by means of a mosquito feeding on an animal. Bosco Louth and her team at Colorado State University collaborated with Larimer County and the CDC to collect eggs from backyard chickens this summer as a new way to study the spread of West Nile virus. We looked at about 120 um, birds across nearly 40 households uh, all around northern Colorado, mostly in the town of Fort Collins, and just took a few eggs from each flock and look to see if we could detect antibody in those eggs. They found a 7% positivity rate in their samples, which the researchers say matches results from typical studies done netting mosquitoes. Margaret Hatcher is the red one. This is Attila the hen. And then in the back there is Annie Yokely. The chicken's lab work is done for the winter, but the study will continue. Ideally, this, this kind of a conceptual program can be continued over years to start to really pinpoint where we're going to see disease epidemics or outbreaks at least within a location. And these girls still have normal chicken work to keep them occupied. They lay up every single day and they're, they're quite delicious. <laughs> this is definitely a greedy, greedy part of the project is that I now have a source of eggs <laughs> and entertainment. For next, I'm Brian Mundland. Angela's going to continue this research when it gets a little warmer and the mosquitoes come out again. If you're in northern Colorado and want to send some chicken eggs her way, we put her contact info in this story on 9news.com. All right, time for a toad trip. A team from Denver Zoo took a drive down to Alamosa this week to pick up some amphibians. Conservation team went there to the Native Aquatic Species Restoration Facility and came back with 95 boreal toads. These endangered frogs take like a little toad siesta during the winter months, sort of like hibernation. Then in the spring, the zoo will see if they want to get it on with each other. If they get jumpy with it, then the zoo will release tens of thousands of tadpoles into the Colorado's waters next summer. The toad's numbers have been dropping in Colorado and New Mexico for decades. They have lost some habitat, and they've been dealing with this, this funky fungus that only clings to amphibians. Your feedback clings to me nightly in all kinds of unfortunate ways. We'll have some of that and a sign that San Santa's getting spelled. That's next. It's a sign. Santa's still training for the big event. It's getting pretty close. Betsy was out at McIntosh Lake at Longmont yesterday, and she spotted the man that clearly is him. We can tell it's him from here. He's getting his steps in around the lake. If you see signs of the season or really anything that catches your eye, send it our way. Email photos to next at 9news.com or use the hashtag HeyNext on Twitter. And feedback this by text tonight about Marshall Zellinger's reporting on homeowners putting boulders and other impediments in public right of ways to keep out homeless encampments. Text says, Kyle, you should know better than to use the adjective hostile in connection with homeowner efforts to combat homeless camping. We made a reference to, to hostile architecture. That's what it's called. That's what it's called when public spaces are engineered in a way to change behavior about their use. Not a value judgment. It's just simply called hostile architecture. Charlie Root says, I'm not going to call that mountain by its new woke name. Charlie, I'm guessing that the old name was not a derogatory term for your wife or, or mother or daughter. And if it was, maybe you'd be willing to look at the new name.